uh, are visiting with us for the first time, we're right at the end of the Book of Judges series. And yet I, I feel like it's going to be a, a study that no matter where you've been at as far as coming in on the series, you're going to be able to get something special out of our study this morning. Uh, as you can see, you have another map. It uh, certainly covers our study last week when we talked about how the little city of Dan there in northern Israel got established by the grandson of Moses. You remember that? When the Danites uh, did not take a hold of the promised land they were given, but tried to find a comfortable place where they could set up the false idols. And of course, Jonathan was their preacher. As we talked about last week, the final five chapters, 17 through 21, are not in chronological orders to the rest of the book. As a matter of fact, we'll see that they actually go back to the beginning of the book itself. Now, the title of our lesson today is Asleep in the Light, wow. chapters 19, 20, and 21. Now, sadly enough, we find that Jonathan, the grandson of Moses, is the most renowned preacher, though a false preacher, up there in the city of Dan. And this is a great shame to all the people of Israel. And so for this to take place, it of course would have been right after Joshua and the elders with him died. And of course, Jonathan is then one of the false teachers that ushers in this time of drifting for all of Israel. Now we come to chapters 19 through 21. And in order to fully understand where this fits in the chronology, there are some certain scriptures that we need to look at. In Judges chapter 20, in verse 27, is a very important scripture. We find that Phineas, the grandson of Aaron, is the high priest of all Israel. He is that zealous Levite that took a stand against immorality there in chapter 25 of Numbers. And literally kind of shish kebab the situation right there. So he was a very zealous man of God. And so he then is the high priest. Secondly, we find this in Judges chapter 20 and verse 1. It says in verse 1, Then all the Israelites from Dan to Beersheba and from the land of Gilead came out as one man and assembled before the Lord at Mizpah. Well, as we've noted in our study of the book of Judges, Israel is used quite loosely. Sometimes it can refer to a tribe. Some can refer to three tribes. But right here, the writer is very specific. He says, all the tribes of Israel, and you look at the map right here, from Dan up top, down to Beersheba, down to the very bottom right here in the middle of Simeon, all of these tribes, as well as Gilead, which represents the Transjordan's tribes, the eastern tribes right here, all of these tribes gather. So in order for all these tribes to gather, we understand now that there is a judge in Israel that's calling everybody together. There's got to be leadership in order for there to be unity. Amen? Well, then who would this judge be? Well, I think the final clue for us actually lies in Judges chapter 20. And we read this. It says in verse 17. Israel, apart from Benjamin, mustered 400,000 swordsmen, all the fighting men. The Israelites went up to Bethel and inquired of God, and they said, Who of us shall go up first against the Benjamites? The Lord replied, Judah shall go up first. So the leader of the tribe of Judah would be the leader of all the Israelites. Amen, guys? So now we have to think, well, if Phineas is alive, it's probably not too long after Joshua and the elders have died. It's certainly during this time that's been ushered in by Phineas and those other false teachers of that hour. Let's go back to chapter 3 of Judges and see who this judge is. You remember the cycle that's laid out in chapter 2. The Israelites were disobedient. They then went into the darkness. They become distressed because of their sin. But in their distress, they cry out to the divine. 
God answers their prayers by sending a deliverer, a judge, and then the judge dies and the cycle begins all over again. Well, right here we're in the middle of the disobedience and the darkness and the distress. The people have cried out to God and we read this in verse 7. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord for they forgot the Lord their God and served the Baal and the Asterisks. The anger of the Lord burned against Israel, so that he sold them into the hands of Cushan Rishathain, king of Aram, Nehem, to whom the Israelites were subject for eight years. But when they cried out to the Lord, he raised up for them a deliverer, Orthaniel, son of Kenes, Caleb's younger brother, who saved them. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him, so that he became Israel's judge and went to war. So right here, does this fit? Well, I think so. Orthanel is the nephew of Caleb. He's also the son-in-law of Caleb. And we know that Caleb was the leader of the tribe of Judah. So Orthanel would be of the tribe of Judah. He is indeed the judge that we'll read about in chapters 19, 20, and 21. You say, well, why isn't it recorded at this point? Because right here, in the first part of the book, the Lord is trying to emphasize how important it is to stay righteous before Him. That when you're disobedient, it leads to the darkness, you'll be distressed. Now, if you've got distress in your life, and maybe some of you do this morning, amen, the whole point is you're supposed to turn to the divine, and then God will send a deliverer. Are you with me right here? But see, the story we're going to talk about is not deliverance from the enemies of God. But civil war between the brothers. And so it's saved for the last of the book. These very shameful days of the time of the judges. The title is Asleep in the Light. Our first point, the wickedness of the world. Judges chapter 19. Come on, Kip. Come on, bro. Come on. In those days, Israel had no king. God was not king of Israel, was he? Now a Levite who lived in a remote area in the hill country of Ephraim took a concubine from Bethlehem in Judah. But she was unfaithful to him. She left him and went back to her father's house of Bethlehem, Judah. After she'd been there four months, her husband went to her to persuade her to return. He had with him his servant two donkeys. She took him into her father's house, and when her father saw him, he gladly welcomed him. His father-in-law, the girl's father, prevailed upon him to stay, so he remained with him three days, eating and drinking and sleeping there. Well, right here, we find that this other Levite, one of the priests of God, had taken a wife, a concubine, from the little city of Bethlehem. And you can see on your map where Bethlehem is in the northern part of Judah. And so he'd come down from the hill country of Ephraim, And he got this wife. Now, a concubine is a legal wife in the Old Testament scriptures. The main difference between a wife and a concubine was that the children did not necessarily share in the inheritance. But she was a true wife. And the Bible says right here in verse 2 that she became unfaithful to him. Now, probably looking at the context and everything, it wasn't that she committed adultery. It's that she just left him for whatever reason. And she goes back to her father's house there in Bethlehem. Well, the Levite thinks about it and says, Okay, I'm going to go forgive my wife. That's a great heart. Amen, guys? And so he goes back, and the father just gladly works. and says, Oh, it's so awesome to have you here. And so they spend three days eating and drinking and having a great time. And in the ensuing text, we find that the father says on the third day when the Levite planned to leave, he says, Hey, can't you stay but one more day? And he goes, okay, I'll stay one more day. Then the next day comes. He goes, well, can't you stay at least until another afternoon? And he goes, okay. He says, can't you stay till the night? And the guy goes, nope, we got to go now. we got to go. And so we pick it up right here in verse 11 of chapter 19. When they were near Jebus, and the day was almost gone, the servant said to his master, come, let's stop in the city of the Jebusites and spend the night. Now we understand that Jebus is Jerusalem. So even though the Israelites at first under Joshua conquered Jerusalem, we find now that the Jebusites have reconquered it and remain in control of what becomes Jerusalem until David comes on the scene. Amen, guys? And the servant says, hey, can't we, can't we stop 
in, in Jebus with the Jebusites. Well, look what he says, verse 12. His master replied, no, we won't go into an alien city where people are not Israelites. We will go on to Gibeah, he added. Come, let's reach Gibeah or Ramah and spend the night in one of those places. So they went on and the sun set and they're near Gibeah in Benjamin. Okay, look at your map right here. They're going up north to the northern part of Ephraim. They're going from Bethlehem, and naturally the first big city they come to is Jebus, or Jerusalem. But of course, that wasn't an Israelite city at this point. And so the Levite says, well, no, we've got to go where the people of God are at. Amen? Amen. And so the next city on the road back to Ephraim is Gibeah. Verse 15. They stopped there to spend the night. They went and sat in the city square, but no one took them into his home for the night. That evening, an old man from the hill country of Ephraim, who was living in Gibeah, the men of the place were Benjamites, came in from his work in the fields. When he looked and saw the traveler in the city square, the old man asked, Where are you going? Where would you come from? He answered, We are on our way from Bethlehem and Judah to a remote hill country of Ephraim where I live. I have been to Bethlehem and Judah, and now I'm going to the house of the Lord. He's going on to Bethel. And if you look at the next city, the next city on the trail is Bethel, the house of the Lord. No one has taken me into his house. We have both straw and fodder for our donkeys and bread and wine for ourselves, your servants. Me, your maidservant, and the young man with us. We don't need anything. Well, that's pretty awesome, huh? Verse 20. You are welcome to my house, the old man said. Let me supply whatever you need. Only don't spend the night in the square. So he took him into his house and fed his donkeys. After they had washed their feet, they had something to eat and drink. This looks like a great time, doesn't it, guys? Verse 22. While they were enjoying themselves, some of the wicked men of the city surrounded the house. Pounding on the door, they shouted to the old man who owned the house, Bring out the man who came to your house so that we can have sex with him. Wow. This is intense. These are the Benjamites. These are the Israelites. These are supposed to be the people of God. You know, I believe it is right what the Levite thought. That we need to expect more of the people of God than the people in the world. Are you with me right here? And so hospitality is one of the greatest signs that disciples love one another. And the love of disciples is one of the signs to a lost world that we are different than the world. You know, it's, it's, it's exciting having so many people here from Portland and Sacramento and Reno, but everything had to be arranged literally just in a few days. But we have over 25 people staying in homes of different disciples here in the church. And I want to commend the church for your hospitality. Amen. And, um, you know, it's kind of cool. Last night we were over at uh, Jay and Angie Hernandez, who are now leading the new Orange County House Church. And uh, Jay just kind of gave us a lesson, kind of laying out what it was going to take in order to evangelize all Orange County. And he says, first of all, we got to be best friends. People got to see our love one for another. And then he went on in Acts chapter 2, and he said, in Acts 2, and we believe that we're striving to be in Acts 2 church. He says, the disciples shared everything they had with one another. And one of the, the wise guys says, well, Jay, can I have your car then? He says, yeah, just take it. And you know, it's like that whole Latin, uh, Spanish expression, mi casa is su casa. You know, in God's church, my house is your house. Amen, guys? That's really how it's supposed to be. And I think we've got some awesome examples of hospitality. It's not, not only in the Hernandez, but also the Bordieres, the Zindlers, the, the Hardings certainly stand on out. But right here, we see that the hospitality of Gibeah is a long way from the kind of love that God wants us to have for one another. Amen, guys? Turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Yeah. Ephesians 5 and verse 3. Paul is talking to Christians. And he says, But among you there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality, of any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be any obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. We need to be a thankful people. Amen, guys? For this you can be sure. Nor a moral, impure, or greedy person, such a man is an idolater. He's pleasing himself. Has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God? Let no one deceive you with empty words, 
Because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. God says, we shouldn't even have a hint of sexual immorality amongst us. Now look what he says. For you were once darkness. Amen, guys? But now you are the light of the Lord. Live as children light. For the fruit of light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. We're not out to please ourselves. We need to figure out what pleases God. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. For it is light that makes everything visible. This is why it said, wake up, O sleeper. Rise from the dead. And Christ will shine on you. You see, the true disciple is not only to be the light of the world, but he is to be light in his brother's life. And we have to have a conviction that we can't have, even between a husband and wife, kind of these sin packs that we're not going to share about our wife's sins if she won't share about our sins. We need to be the light of the world. Are you with me right here? And our job is to bring light into every situation, even to expose the darkness. Are you with me here, church? You know, it's sad, but too many churches today, people are asleep in the light. That's why, that's why the last part it says right here, he says, wake up, O sleeper. What does he equate sleep with? Rise from the dead. He says, you are dead spiritually. When you're sleeping in the light. Turn to Revelation chapter 3. In Revelation 3, 1, Jesus speaks further on this subject. Verse 1. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up! Strengthen what remains is about to die. For I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you received and heard. Obey it and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief. And you will not know at what time I will come to you. Jesus talking to this church right here in Sardis. He says, you have the reputation of being on fire for God, but you know you are dead by your deeds. He says, I'm saying, wake up. Strengthen what remains. Obey and repent. You know, it's kind of interesting. I was uh, talking to, to Damon and Vicky when they came on in. And uh, I, I was saying, uh, Vicky, did, did you get up grumpy this morning? She says, no, I let Damon sleep. Oh! You know, when you, when you wake someone up, have you ever woken your spouse up? Or your kids up. They're a little grumpy. You know what I'm talking about right here? The same thing happens when we try to wake up people inside the church. People can be a little grumpy, a little defensive. Because they're comfortable in their bed asleep. Are you with me right here? You know, it was really exciting having uh, Joan and Kyle fly on in uh, from Hilo, Hawaii. And uh, we all gather there at about 6.15 in the morning to greet him. Because that's one of the things that disciples do is to, is to greet fellow disciples when they come into town. And uh, I'm not going to mention the fact that Mike Underhill was late coming to the occasion. But there, there was one brother that was late for this occasion. And I said, I, 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 I said to uh, Mike, I said, uh, hey, what? Bro, what happened right here? I mean, sold out disciples get up early. You know what I'm talking about? And he goes, well, brother, you know, the other brothers, they just left me uh, in the room and they went off to the airport and they didn't wake me up. I said, well, well, bro, uh, what did you think? He said, well, I, I was really mad that they didn't wake me up. I said, well, you know, could you imagine what it would be like if instead of the brothers going to the airport, they had met Jesus in the air and you were there left alone 
And everybody was going, well, look at what the book of Revelation says. He says, if you don't repent, if you don't wake up, I will come like a thief. And you will not know at what time I will come. You will be there like Mike Underhill and everybody else is going to be gone. See, it's up to you to wake up. Are you with me here, church? Getting back to the book of Judges now after that detour. We find that what had happened there in Gibeah, what had happened in Benjamin is, and we learn this from chapter 3 of Judges, is they had intermarried with the Canaanites. And they had adopted the sinful ways of the Canaanites. And thus, now, there was no difference between the life of the idolatrous Canaanites and the supposed people of God. You see, they were asleep in the light. How bad was it? Homosexuality dominated the city of Gibeah. Well, what happened? Point number two. They allowed fear to rule. In verse... 23, we read these words. The owner of the house went outside and said to them, No, my friends, don't be so vile. Since this man is my guest, don't do this disgraceful thing. I mean, the guy had some convictions. Amen, guys? Look, here's my virgin daughter and his concubines. I will bring them out to you now, and you can use them and do with them whatever you wish. Wow. Wow. You know, sometimes we don't appreciate how much Christianity and Jesus Christ have changed the world. For women back in this day, they weren't just second class citizens. They were like not citizens at all. They were to be used and abused and thrown away. Jesus said, listen, there is no difference between man or woman. All are in my family and are equal in my eyes. Let's go back to our text. And you can do with them whatever you wish. But to this man, don't do such a disgraceful thing. But the men would not listen to them. So the man took his concubine, sent her outside of them, and they raped her and abused her throughout the night. And at dawn, they let her go. At daybreak, the women went back to the house where her master was staying, fell down at the door, and lay there until daylight. When the master got up in the morning and opened the door of the house and stepped out to continue on his way, there lay his concubine, fallen in the doorway of the house with her hands on the threshold. He said to her, get up, let's go. But there was no answer. Then the man put her on his donkey and set out for home. When he reached home, he took a knife and cut up his concubine, limb by limb, into twelve parts. And sent them into all the areas of Israel. Everyone who saw it said, such a thing has never been seen or done, not since the day the Israelites came up out of Egypt. Think about it. Consider it. Tell us what to do. Now we find... In chapter 20, verse 5, why he handed his concubine on over to these vile people. It says, during the night, the men of Gibeah came after me. This is the Levite talking. And surrounded the house, intending to kill me. He allowed fear to rule. What a sad thing. Here was this couple that had made up. And some might suggest that the husband still had bitterness in heart because of the unfaithfulness of his wife. You know, you've got to crucify all bitterness. Are you with me right here? And it was this leftover bitterness that allowed him to say, listen, I'm, I'm fearful for my life. Take her! And the Bible says, That while he slept in his bed, they gang raped her, they physically abused her, and then in the morning, after his sleep, he goes out to go on his way as if nothing had happened. And what I picture is this young lady sprawled out in the steps of the house with her hand just reaching towards the door because the man that was supposed to protect her the man that had pledged to protect her before God 
had failed because he feared. There are very few scenes in the Bible that I think are so, so disheartening and pathetic is the failure of a man to protect his wife and family. And he did this while the woman was screaming about being gang raped and beaten. And he was in his bed, comfortable and in time, asleep. Fear. The enemy of the disciple. How many disciples have turned back because of persecution? Persecution comes in two areas of the disciple's life. Life and doctrine. We're persecuted not simply because we have convictions about purity in our lives as singles and purity in our marriage relationships. But we are persecuted because we believe it is the will of God and thus we tell others this is what's right. We are persecuted because of doctrine. Because the Bible teaches us one way to be saved. You have to have faith. You have to repent. You have to become a disciple. And you have to be water baptized for the forgiveness of sins to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And when people have not obeyed the word of God, and they're asleep to what the Word of God teaches. They lash out in persecution and hatred, thinking to strike down the messenger is to strike down the message. You know, I remember in the early days of the Boston church, one of my best friends was one of the elders. His name was Paul McNeil. He was 79 years old. Lance, Lance Underhill actually knew him. And uh, the church there in Boston was just getting going. I mean, it was amazing what God was doing. And you know, when you start doing something, you start becoming controversial. You know, nobody's controversial unless they're doing something. But we were not only getting controversial, we were getting a lot of persecution. Because of the call to be a disciple before you're baptized. That we believe those were the only people that were saved according to God's word. And we had this one preacher visit us who, who actually was very critical. And he asked to get with uh, Paul and myself for breakfast at Denny's after he'd come to church. He says, you know something? Church service was amazing. I've never seen anything like it. But you know something? Chip, if you would preach the word more carefully, you would not be controversial or get persecution. And I'm sitting there at Denny's, and Paul, the elder, knew I was getting ticked. And all of a sudden, I felt this hand on my arm. You're like, easy, easy. And I, I was ticked. And you know, you know how you just, you got to say something? So I had to start saying something. I didn't even know what I was going to say. I said, do you know something? And I didn't know what I was going to say right then. <laughs> Do you know something? In the Old Testament, all the prophets were persecuted. I go, yeah, that's right. That's awesome. <laughs> Paul still got his hand to me. I said, you know something else? In the New Testament, all the apostles were persecuted and killed. Go on. Dang, that's good. <laughs> I said, you know something? Jesus, who was perfect, who never sinned, who said the right word at the right time all the time, not only was he controversial, not only was he persecuted, not only was he deserted, he was killed. Don't tell me you can do it better than Jesus. Wow. <laughs> See, I believe if you're going to be like Jesus... You're going to be persecuted. You're going to be persecuted. But you know something? If you allow fear to rule, you're not going to be able to stand as a disciple. And in time, because you don't want to ruffle any feathers, you don't want to be controversial, your life is going to fade to the point that there really is no difference between your life 
and the life of Now you may have some different convictions in your mind, but the issue to Jesus is your deeds. And there's no difference between you and the people of the world. That was what happened to the people of Gibeah. And you know, you're looking at this situation right here, and you go, why? Why could he sleep while his wife was gang raped abused? It's because he feared what would happen if he took a stand. Point number three. Sentimentality kills. Sentimentality kills. We need to look at a scripture in the book of the law, the book of Leviticus, chapter 20. And we'll understand better, I think, the actions that are recorded in this chapter. In Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 13 it says, and this is the law of God given to Moses by God himself. If a man lies with a man as one lies with a woman, both of them have done what is detestable. They must be put to death. Their blood will be on their own heads. That's the command of God in the Old Testament. And so, knowing that, and knowing the previous passage, we now begin to understand what gets stirred in the hearts of the disciples. At this point, the Levite finally gets some convictions to seeing what the sin had done to his wife. And he does something that that is just detestable in and of itself. And we just need to say this. Not everything in the Bible is a command of God or the desire of God. But at least it's allowed by God. Are you with me right here, guys? And so when he takes his wife home and cuts her into 12 pieces, we understand what he's about to do. He literally sends a piece of that woman to each of the 12 tribes. Somebody got a head. Somebody got a hand. Somebody got a foot. And he says, this is what was done in Gibeah of Benjamin. And so what happens? Chapter 20, verse 1. Sentimentality kills. Then all the Israelites from Dan to Beersheba and from the land of Gilead came out as one man and assembled before the Lord at Mizpah. This was the watchtower. That's what Mizpah means. They gathered together. Why would they gather? Because the judge calls the people of God together. And they came together because of a cause. You can never be a united people unless you have a vision, unless you have a cause. Are you with me right here? That's why it's so important for the church to have a cause. God has given us a vision and a mission to evangelize the nations in this generation. If you take away that vision, you take away the sense of oneness that's possible. Reading on right here in verse 2. The leaders of all the people of the tribes of Israel took their places in the assembly of the people of God. 400,000 soldiers armed with the swords. The Benjamites heard that the Israelites had gone to Mizpah. Then the Israelites said, tell us how this awful thing happened. Okay, a couple things right here. Number one, we find that the soldiers of Judah now number 400,000. Excuse me, soldiers of Israel, number 400,000. That's probably a very accurate number, and it shows how recent after the conquering the promised land it was. In the first census, taken right after the Exodus, there were about 600,000 fighting men in Israel. The second census, these are recorded in the book of Numbers, taken right before they go into the promised land, there was about 600,000 fighting men. So minus the men of Benjamin, and with the loss of lives... The number of soldiers is going to be about 400,000. They're still very organized because they're not that far away from the time of Joshua. Are you with me right here? The second thing to notice right here is that the Benjamites heard that the Israelites had gone up to Mizpah. Now the Benjamites had gotten a piece of that woman. And already they decided not to be a part of things. So they gather at Mizpah. The guy shares about what happens. And in verse 8 we read this. All the people rose as one man saying, None of us will go home. No, not one of us will turn to his house. 
But now this is what we'll do to Gibeah. We'll go up against it as a lot directs. We'll take ten men out of a hundred from all the tribes of Israel, and a hundred from a thousand, and a thousand from ten thousand, to get provisions for the army. Then, when the army arrives at Gibeah and Benjamin, it can give them what they deserve for all this vileness, vileness done in Israel. So all the men of Israel got together and united as one man against the city. See, in their mind, they're living under the law at this point. Are you with me right here? And the law says that the men of Gibeah, because of their homosexuality, deserve to die. So the Israelites are doing what the, the Bible commands. Verse 12. The tribes of Israel sent men throughout the tribe of Benjamin, saying, What about this awful crime that was committed among you? Now surrender those wicked men of Gibeah, so we may put them to death and purge the evil from Israel. Well, isn't that what people of the light are supposed to do, is to expose the light? And so the Israelites said, hey, fellow Benjamites, you've got to expose the light with your brothers right here. But the Benjamites would not listen to their fellow Israelites. From the towns that came together to Gibeah to fight against the Israelites. At once the Benjamites mobilized 26,000 swordsmen from the towns. In addition to 700 chosen men from those living in Gibeah. Among all these soldiers there were 700 chosen men who were left handed. Each of whom could sling a stone at a hair and not miss. Remember the left handed judge Ehud? Remember that? Now the ironic thing that I didn't tell you is Benjamin means the son of a right handed man. So it's a little bit ironic right there. <laughs> Verse 17. Israel, apart from Benjamin, mustered 400,000 swordsmen, all of them fighting men. The Israelites went up to Bethel and inquired of God. They said, who of us shall go up first to fight against the Benjamites? The Lord replied, Judah shall go first. Right here, the battle lines are drawn. Not because the Israelites are responding to the word of God to do what is right. It's because the Benjamites refuse to discipline and deal with the sin that's amongst them. I think to the casual observer, they're just looking at this as a civil war. Not in the eyes of God. God is using this situation as a purification for His people. A purging so that His people can be a pure people for Him to be used by Him to His glory. Are you with me right here? You know, it's very interesting. How many people substitute relationships over truth. See, that's sentimentality. That's sentimentality. When you value relationship over truth, it's sentimentality. Jesus said, if any man would come after me, he must deny himself, take his cross daily, and follow me. He says, bottom line, if you don't hate your father, your mother, your wife, your brother, your sister, yea, even your own life, you cannot be my disciple. There is no room for sentimentality in the life and the heart of a disciple. Amen. A disciple says, God and His truth is number one. And my relationships are second. Now that does produce persecution. It does. But what if you don't want to be persecuted? Then you're sentimental and you value relationships over truth. You find some way to rationalize around that. You know, when Elaine and I went to the Portland church in 2003, the Portland church used an expression that I'd never quite heard. It says, if you're doing lousy spiritually, you're very man-focused. Hey, I wonder what that means, man-focused. I, I hadn't heard that term. And I said, what's, what's, that, what's that mean? And they said, well, to be man-focused is that you just think about what other people are thinking. That you're concerned about what you're, they're thinking. That you change your actions because of what you perceive that they're thinking. And I go, you know something? That's, that's, that's an incredible thing. So you're saying that in order to do good spiritually, you've got to be God-focused. He said, exactly. I said, I like that terminology. That's good. I'm going to start using that. You see, when you're man-focused, you're sentimental. And you look at things unspiritually. Because your priorities are wrong. When you're God-focused, you look at what God wants you to do first, and then you deal with the relationships accordingly. Are you with me right here? You know, I think so many people that are young disciples, when they get into situations in their family, it's so hard for them. And yet the Bible teaches very clearly that God is first, then His church, and then our physical families. That's a tough teaching. Well, why? Because God wants our physical families to be saved. Now, some things that kind of shake people on up, 
is when somebody in our physical family gets sick or somebody in our physical family starts to oppose us or someone, this is a tough one, in our physical family dies and they have not obeyed the scriptures about having faith, repentance, becoming a disciple and being baptized. And the disciple then is faced with the choice. Do I compromise what I know the word of God says or do I become sentimental which at time can even take you out of the kingdom. Are you with me right here, guys? See, we've got to have a conviction that sentimentality kills your spiritual life because you're man-focused and not God-focused. Let's keep on reading the Word of God right here. The fourth point. Sin ends in disaster. In Judges chapter 20, 19 through 26, we find that the battle lines are drawn the Israelites fight the Benjamites. And on the first day, the Benjamites are victorious. As a matter of fact, 22,000 Israelites die. The second day, they have another battle. Sadly enough, 18,000 more Israelites die. And the Benjamites are again victorious. Have you ever felt that way before? When you're trying to do what's right and you seem to get defeated and pounded down? Well, that's how the Israelites were feeling. And so they go to God. They say, God, is this really your will? And God says, yes, you will be victorious on the third day. And then we read verse 46. On that day, 25,000 Benjamite swordsmen fell, all of them valiant fighters. But 600 men turned and fled in the desert to the Rock of Rimmon, where they stayed four months. The men of Israel went back to Benjamin and put all the towns to the sword, including the animals and everything else they found. All the towns they came across, they set on fire. Wow. You can see the influence now of Phineas. He still kept his convictions, even though by this time, he's an old guy, like Ken Zindler. You know what I'm talking about? You see, I mean, you know, a lot of times, you know how it is when you age. You have this tendency when you age just to get more chill. Because when you age, you want, you want everybody to like you. You know what I mean, Marty? You know what I'm talking about right here? And yet, it's, it's, the, it's, it's, it's the rare dude that as he gets older, he still keeps a sense of conviction that there's right and there's wrong. There's God's truth and there's man's ways. And Phineas was strong to the end. Yeah, he was zealous as a boy prophet. But he was zealous as an older man of God. And he would not compromise. They completely eradicated, eradicated the sin. You know, it is an awesome thing to be living under the New Testament, though, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <thank you. laughs> sin ends in disaster. The, the same teaching is true. But you know, all the sins that we have done, there is not a one that cannot be forgiven by God. Even, even homosexuality can be forgiven. There's just, there's just not one sin that can't be forgiven. I'll never forget one story, and I was thinking about it as I was studying this morning. It was early on in the Boston church, and as our custom is in the church, when, when we have a, a baptism, we, we like to do a little singing afterwards. And this particular baptism happened at night, and it was one of the campus girls. And so we're all in the circle singing, we're just we're so fired up, she just got baptized. And she brought one of her friends out who had never been to church before. Remember the first time you came to church? I'm scared the pejesus out of you. <laughs> and we're all singing, everybody's happy, and all of a sudden this one young lady, the friend, starts crying. Not only does she cry, she runs out of the church building. Hey, oh boy. So Elena goes and runs out after her, and she's sitting in the car just sobbing. And evidently, Elena was just talking to her. You know, you know how Elena is. She's very soft and gentle. Oh, yes, yes. She says, is there anything wrong? No, there's nothing wrong. Well, there must be something wrong. Well, I really love what I saw, but I, I know I could never be a Christian. Elena goes, that's not true. Yes, it is. Everybody at your church is such a goody-goody. They've never done anything wrong. <laughs> she didn't know us very well, did she? And Lance says, that's, that's not true. She says, you don't understand my sin. I, I've had an abortion. 
Now, I've, had, I've had two abortions. And I said, listen, God will forgive anything. Two weeks later, we're back at the church building for this girl's baptism. We're singing and we're having a great time again. We're all fired up. She's fired up. And then she starts crying again. And then she runs out of the church building again. And then Elena goes out and follows her again. And Elena goes, what's wrong? She goes, I'm just so happy. <laughs> she says, Elena, I have a question for you. Do you think that now that, that God has forgiven me, and you told me, has forgotten my sin, do you think I can wear a white wedding dress for my wedding? Elena goes, absolutely. You totally understand the grace of God. And a few years later, she wore that white dress. You see, sin ends in disaster. But Jesus saves us. Our fifth point, understanding neutrality's consequences. Understanding neutrality's consequences. Remember that we have 600 men left of Benjamin. There are no more Benjamite women. There are no more Benjamite children. There's only 600 men at the rock of Rimmon. And we read this in chapter 21, verse 1. The men of Israel had taken an oath of Mizpah. Not one of us will give his daughter in marriage to a Benjamite. The people went to Bethel, where they sat before God until evening, raising their voices and weeping bitterly. Oh, Lord, the God of Israel, they cried. Why has this happened to Israel? Why should one tribe be missing from Israel today? Early the next day, the people built an altar and presented burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. Then the Israelites asked, who from all the tribes of Israel has failed to assemble before the Lord? For they've taken a solemn oath that anyone who failed to assemble before the Lord at Mizpah should certainly put to death. So there are two oaths they took. They said, number one, ain't nobody going to marry a Benjamite. Wow. And number two, if you don't show up at church, you're going to die. <laughs> you talk about a hardline pulpit. That's a hardline pulpit. You know what I'm talking about, Rocco? You know what I mean? Amen. Okay. Let's get back to the text now. Verse 6. Now the Israelites grieved for their brothers, the Benjamites. Today one tribe is cut off from Israel, they said. How can we provide wives for those who are left? Since we've taken an oath by the Lord not to give any of them our daughters in marriage. Then they asked, which one of the tribes of Israel failed to assemble before the Lord of Mizpah? They discovered that no one from Jebesh Gilead had come up to the camp of the assembly. For when they counted the people, they found that none of the people of Jebesh Gilead were there. So the assembly sent 12,000 fighting men with instructions to go to Jebus Gilead and put to the sword those living there, including the women and the children. This is what you do, they said. Kill every male and every woman who is not a virgin. They found among the people living in Jebus Gilead 400 young women who had never slept with a man, and they took them to the camp at Shiloh in Canaan. You look at your map again. Jebus Gilead is right across the Jordan River on the east side. And... This was not a case where they didn't know about the assembly at Mizpah. It wasn't that they didn't know about the time of church. In fact, what this was, and most likely because they were one of the Transjordan tribes, they said, you know something? This really is more for the people on the west side of the Jordan. I, I think, you know, I don't want to choose between the Benjamites and the Israelites. I just want to be neutral. I just want to be sort of a spiritual Geneva. And so we're, we're just going to stay here. Little did they know that that second oath was to kill anybody who didn't show up. And so, of course, the Israelites came and they fulfilled the oath. You know what's interesting, though, is that in time, Jebus Gilead is replenished. And a group of people came up that were very special. Turn just a sh few years later to 1 Samuel chapter 11. In 1 Samuel chapter 11, we read this in verse 1. This is after the time of the judges. This is during the beginning of Saul's kingship. Nahash the Ammonite went up and besieged Jebus Gilead. There we are again, guys. And all the men of Jebus said to him, Make a tree with us and we'll be subject to you. Well, that's not too good. <laughs> But Nahash the Ammonite replied, I will make a treaty with you only in the condition that I gorge out the right eyes of every one of you and so bring disgrace on all Israel. Now, they didn't like that. So Saul hears about this. Well, now, it's interesting 
Saul was from what tribe? Benjamin. Verse 6. When Saul heard their words, the Spirit of God came upon him in power, and he burned with anger. He took a pair of oxen, cut them into pieces, and sent the pieces by messages throughout Israel, proclaiming, This is what will be done to the oxen of anyone who does not follow Saul and Samuel. Then when the terror of the Lord fell on the people and they turned out as one man, when Saul mustered them at Bezek, the men of Israel numbered 300,000 and the men of Judah 30,000. So right here, Saul does a little similar thing to the Levite, right? Except he used an ox. Amen. Praise God. And he got everybody going and then he called upon people to be loyal. He says, we need to deal with this enemy of God. And everybody needs to get behind Samuel and me. He called for loyalty. We read on, and they were victorious. Well, many years passed. As a matter of fact, Saul kind of turns to the dark side. And yet he was still king of Israel when he dies. And so we read this final chapter of his life in 1 Samuel, chapter 31, verse 8. The next day, when when the Philistines came to strip the dead, they found Saul and his three sons fallen on Mount Gilboa. They cut off his head and stripped off his armor, and they sent messages throughout the land of the Philistines to proclaim the news in the temple of their idols amongst their people. They put his armor in the temple of the Asterisk and fastened his body to the wall of Bethshan. When the people of Jebesh Gilead heard of what the Philistines had done to Saul, all their valiant men journeyed to the night to Bethshan. They took down the bodies of Saul and his sons from the wall of Bethshan and went to Jebesh, where they burned him. Then took the bones and buried them under a tamarisk tree at Jabesh. And they fasted seven days. Wow. These guys from Jabesh Gilead, instead of playing neutral, they become some of the most valiant, loyal men of all Israel. Saul was still the Lord's anointed when he died. And the Bible says that the enemies of God had cut off his head and fastened his body to the wall. And the people of Jebus Gilead said, listen, we're not forgetting the good that Saul did. He saved us from the Ammonites back there earlier. And so the Bible says in the middle of the night, they risked their lives to save a dead Saul. Now that's loyalty. You know, a lot of people, they get taken aback these days. And they look at these Muslim guys that are blowing themselves up. And certainly it's a misguided cause. But it frightens them. That level of commitment. That level of loyalty. Jesus Christ called the first century disciples to be that committed to him and that committed to each other. That's why the modern church has so little impact. People don't understand the measure and the magnitude of the kind of passion, commitment, and love for God and love for one another that the Bible commands. Are you with me right here? In the first century, the man that was the most neutral person during the trial of Jesus was Pilate. He didn't want to make a choice between the religious fanatics of Jesus and the Jewish leaders. And so he says, I wash my hands of the situation. You know something? His indecision became decision. His Maswell said, Jesus, you will be crucified. But he played neutral and Jesus was crucified. John F. Kennedy said... Quoting his favorite quote from Dante's Inferno. The hottest places in hell are reserved for those during the time of moral crisis. Preserve their neutrality. As disciples of Jesus Christ, we are in a moral dilemma in this world. We are in a moral dilemma in our former fellowship. And it's time to stop being neutral and take a stand for Jesus Christ. Are you with me right here? The men of Jewish Gilead set a good example. They were neutral, they repent, and they become some of the most valiant men of all Israel. Wow. Let's close on out. Judges chapter 21, our last point, purity restored. Okay. We find that after wiping out Jebus Gilead, there are 400 women that are spared. And so in verse 13. When the whole assembly sent an offer of peace to the Benjamites to the rock of Rimmon, so the Benjamites returned at that time and were given the women of Jebus Gilead, who had been spared, but there were not enough for all of them. Well, how many Benjamites were there? There were 600, and they only fixed up 400 of these guys. Verse 15. The people grieved for Benjamin because the Lord had made a gap in the tribes of Israel. And the elders of the assembly said, 
With the women of Benjamin destroyed, how shall we provide wives to the men who are left? The Benjamite survivors must have heirs, they said, so the tribe of Israel will not be wiped out. We can't give them our daughters and wives since the Israelites have taken this oath. Cursed be anyone who gives a wife to the Benjamite. Well, of course, the women of Jebus Gilead were under that oath. But look, there's an annual festival of the Lord in Shiloh to the north of Bethel, and the east of the road that goes to Bethel to Shechem and to the south of Lebanon. So they instructed the Benjamites, saying, Go and hide in the vineyards and watch. When the girls of Shiloh come out to join in the dancing, then rush to the vineyards, and each of you sees a wife from the girls of Shiloh and go to the land of Benjamin. When their fathers and brothers complain to us, we'll say to them, Do us a kindness by helping them, because we didn't get wives for them during the war, and you're innocent since you didn't give your daughters to them. So that is what the Benjamites did. While the girls were dancing, each man caught one, carried her off to be his wife, then returned to the inheritance and rebuilt the towns and settled in them. At that time, the Israelites left that place, went home to their tribes and clans, each to his own inheritance. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as he saw fit. But at least they were married. Amen, guys? Okay, now. (laughs) For the casual observer, they missed the point right here, though. There are only 600 men, Benjamites, left. And God desires a pure people. Amen? Yeah. Well, they got four of them, 400 of them, wives. 200 were left wanting. And so they were a bit creative to get the other 200 wives. Yeah. <laughs> so what happened then? 600 Benjamites were now set up by their brothers. And they married. No longer was homosexuality the course that was followed in Benjamin but the way of God sex inside of marriage sex inside of marriage was meant to produce children and of course we're talking about physical Israel and of course now we're the church we're spiritual Israel and we need to have spiritual children Amen? amen and so what they had done right here is something amazing under the leadership of Orthanel and under the zealousness of Phineas They had a radical calling out of the tribe of Benjamin. Then all of the remnant of Benjamin is set up to now be pure before the Lord. And to produce children of the Lord. And the tribe would then be a pure tribe and family before the Lord their father. Amen, guys? You see, we need to understand... That's exactly what we're trying to do in this fellowship and our fellowship around the world. We believe that churches have gotten so far out there that we need to pull in all those people that want to be totally sold out and begin new churches so that there can be spiritual children that will propagate throughout that city, throughout that nation, and throughout this world. Are you with me right here? Because the principle right here is amazing. Benjamin, as it was, could not be pleasing to God. There was just too much sin, too much lukewarmness. But when the radical calling out came and everybody got uh, repented and got wives and children, then Benjamin could be rebuilt. Is it any wonder then that the next great judge after Orthanel is Ehud, the left handed Benjamite? Out of these people came their next judge. Is it any wonder that the first king of Israel was a Benjamite, King Saul? And is it any wonder the most wild, reckless, controversial apostle was Paul a Benjamite? That legacy lasted down into the church and of which all of us, as we study the Pauline scriptures, are even fruit of that day of purifying God's people. You know, church, the Lord has blessed us in great ways. In the first four months of the work, we've seen 25 people baptized into Christ, 33 people Restored and 48 people place membership. That's incredible when you, when you see that we just started with a little group of 42 disciples. Now, were these disciples perfect? No way. 
Some, somebody said, well, can you have a week sold out disciple? Absolutely. That's what a bunch of us were. But the point is, is that God was still number one in our lives. You with me? In our heart and in our deeds. And in four months' time, the church has almost quadrupled. You see, when you have a pure group of disciples, they can multiply and make disciples, who make more disciples, who make more disciples, who make more disciples, and a whole city can be filled. Who make more disciples and more disciples, who can go to the surrounding cities, and a whole nation can be filled. Who can make more disciples, who can go to the surrounding nations, and in time, the whole world can be evangelized in a generation. What is the challenge for us today? It's very simple. Number one, W, the wickedness of the world. Number two, A, allowed fear to rule. Number three, sentimentality kills. K. Number four, sin ends in destruction. E. Number five, understanding neutrality's consequence. U. And number six, purity restored. P. The challenge, wake up. One man awake can awaken another. The second can awaken his next door brother. Three awake can rouse a town and turn the whole place upside down. And many awake can raise such a fuss that it finally awakens the rest of us. One man up with dawn in his eyes multiplies. Let's go in to all the world. Thank you and God bless.